going to Louisiana, my true love for to see. For the rain all night today, I left the weather, it was dry. Sun so hot, it froze to death, Susanna, don't you cry. <laughs> so it was my mother that introduced me to Bob Childress as a, as a very young man reading The Man Who Moved the Mountains. And uh, I have a chapter about Bob in my Ararat book, and like I say, Kathy has her uh, her book here, which is brand new, and we're gonna let her talk here in just a minute uh, about Bob. I don't pretend to be an expert on Bob Childress, so now I have to walk over here and look because I can't remember everything anymore. So our story begins with a fellow named David Sampson, who you probably never heard of. He was born in England in uh, 1845. 1888, David Sampson started something called the Blue Ridge Mission, which purchased land in Patrick County, and he came up here and they built a church and a school over several years, uh, which of course is still our school. It was the Blue Ridge Mission School. David, uh, the first principal was a guy named Samuel Pickett, and they had teachers Sally Marshburn or Marshburn and Mary Anderson. If you read The Man Who Moved the Mountain, the names are probably familiar to you. Uh, there she is, the first Blue Ridge. They had uh, 27 acres. I think the first year they had 150 students. Uh, they built dorms for the men and the women at Blue Ridge. And uh, they built a cross-shaped building, which I think is what we're looking at right there. Uh, of course, this is on the same spot that uh, Blue Ridge is, I think, today. But there's the very first picture I know of, of uh, Blue Ridge. <laughs> All this stuff is at Guilford College. That's why I mention it. The Quakers are the ones who come up here and start this school. And David Sampson is the leader of that group. And that's all about 1888, 1889, which is, of course, the same year on January 19th, 1889, that uh, Bob Childress was born. I guess he was born, I think he was born <laughs> down on Boyd Hollow where the Hasten House, is that how you pronounce his name, Hasten uh, House is today. And of course their cemetery is, is right there. Uh, so Bob Childress and Blue Ridge School kind of grew up together, I guess you would say, <coughs> in a funny sort of way. Uh, this is, uh, like I said, off, off Boyd Hollow over here. I went out there to take this picture. The sky was just glorious that day. and. Uh, I was very concerned I was going to run into some snakes. I didn't see a single snake until I went down to uh, Bertie and Theodore's house. Ann has bought it, and I went in the house to uh, try to uh, check on it for, as I do every couple of weeks, and I came face to face with a four-foot black snake. I sent Ann a message and told her she had a renter. <laughs> <laughs> and here's some pictures from Blue Ridge. Uh, most of all these pictures, uh, I got from Bobby Clement, who I think got them from Carrie Sue Culler. Uh, who knows where Carrie Sue got them? She might have took them. Who knows? But uh, these are all pictures of Blue Ridge uh, a little later. But they had dorms. Uh, they had a school. They had a church. I'm not going to get into all the details about that. But uh, they uh, eventually, of course, are going to, the Quakers are going to sell it to the Presbyterians. And I think then the Presbyterians sell it to the county. And a couple more pictures with school. You seen all these, Shelby? Have you seen all of these? Most all of these I either got from Bobby or Guilford College. Guilford <laughs> College has a huge collection of uh, Blue Ridge School stuff that you can go and, and read through if you're interested in that sort of thing. <laughs> the thing you read about in The Man Who Moved the Mountain is a couple things. One is Bob Childers talks about the first time he ever had a drink of alcohol. I think he's three years old. His mother, I think, gave it to him on a rag. And, uh, you know, Ararat was a little different place then. And it's much more violent. Well, maybe it's much more violent. I don't know. But uh, a lot of alcohol. Uh, that's the Hatfields and the McCoys up there in the top left. There's a lot of violence. A lot of people getting killed here. The Quakers come in here to try to change that. And uh, they have a time. They really have a time. Uh, one of the hobbies that uh, Bob Childress writes about in The Man of the Mountain is this thing they called rocking, where I guess your hobby was you threw rocks at buildings and or people. So Ernest T. Bass was real. <laughs> and Otis there, uh, Otis was very much real in, in Ararat, uh, which 
in September. Danny will talk all about all of this. But, uh, you know, I, I never realized until, I guess, this week that throwing rocks at people in buildings was a real thing. And they really did that. That was something that Bob Children's Rights about doing. This is my favorite picture. Oh, look at Emma. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah. here we go with the back row is, uh, is an interesting, interesting crowd, isn't it? Uh, you got the ladies in the front. So from far right, you got Davis Reed Smith and Marion, and then you got Harry Epperson there in the middle. You got George Gwynn, Theodore and Gray's daddy, and little old Bob Childress, who was a big man, looks awful small compared to this bunch of hooligans, doesn't he? <laughs> I was just thinking, I was just thinking, I knew three of these guys, actually knew them in my life, Harry and George and Davis. Davis, of course, would be Fred and Reed's father. Uh, so uh, that came from Bobby Clement, and uh, I wanted to share that with you because that's one of my favorite pictures of all the ones I've ever found. Uh, but Harry looks like he's ready to go start a radio station, I guess. George delivered the mail, and Bob, of course, became the man who moved to Mountain. And uh, Davis Reed Smith over there uh, is, like I said, Fred and Reed's and Joey's and Colts and you know it goes on. I think I've only known four or five Davis Smiths in my life. Four or five. <laughs> so how many of y'all related to people in this picture? Oh, Everybody? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh me. But uh, anyway I wanted to share that with you because that's uh, I just love that picture. That's an Ararat Mafia meeting if I ever saw one right there. Bob is going to meet and marry Pearl Ayers in 1912. I think that's Pearl on the front left there uh, in this picture. Uh, I don't know exactly who everybody else in this picture is, but I'm pretty sure that's Pearl. They, of course, will have two children together, a son and a daughter. Uh, Pearl will die in 1918, uh, and she's buried there in the Children's Cemetery off of uh, Blue Floyd Hollow Road. Beside Haston, who is uh, Bob's brother, Bob's older brother, who probably is as influential <coughs> on Bob Childress as any man alive, getting him and supporting him. Bob also, from oral tradition that I know, uh, lived over near where Harry Epperson's house is today, up there on Fence Post Road. And if you look down towards Squirrel Spur from there, Bob, from the oral tradition that I've gathered, had his blacksmith's shop in that area. Well, the other thing that came through that area about the same time was the Dinky Railroad. So Bob, Bob's blacksmith shop, I'm pretty sure, was right along the Dinky Railroad, the Manor and Eastern, which we've done programs about here. But uh, like I said, uh, he lived over there pretty close to where I think Harry Epperson's house is today. <coughs> And the thing that I was going to talk about, and, and this is just a theory of mine, if you know where I'm talking about, or as I like to say, the end of Bobby Clements driveway, that's where I think Bob's uh, blacksmith shop might have been. Uh, Clark's Creek Progressive Church is right there. And I've often wondered if Bob Childress wasn't sitting there doing blacksmith work and would hear the choir, or they had a brush arbor, whatever they did, if he heard them singing out there while he was blacksmithing. Because as you know, later on, Bob would take the unusual stance of inviting them to come to his white churches to sing. And one of the young people who was there was Fred Brian. Fred was there in that church and told me, you know, he remembered Bob Childress very well and him inviting them to come. And so, you know, I can't prove that, but I think it's very possible that that's where Bob maybe got the idea to invite them to come to his churches. Of course, we all know that, I guess, is Beasley's store when we were all kids at the crossroads. And uh, and right across there from where our, our good friend, the great Greg Radford grew up uh, and everything. But, uh, but anyway, Fred, Fred, uh, Fred was always an interesting guy to me because he couldn't go to Blue Ridge. He ended up being the principal of Blue Ridge. In 1912, of course, the shootout at Hillsville happens. 
And this really kind of changes Bob Childress's life. I think he started to realize a lot about the violence. And uh, I always love his quote about him. He said, I was hardly ever sober, not even in the morning. I was miserable and sick to my soul. And that's when I think he started to turn his life over to Jesus Christ. And like I said, Bob Childress loses his wife and finds himself a single father uh, in the holla. Uh, he's going to marry Mamie Leela Montgomery in 1919. Uh, this is the cabin that's down, uh, what I guess used to be the Moyer Dillon back place. Eric owns this now, is that what yes. you Eric owns this now. And this, by old tradition, has always been a cabin that people said Bob Childress lived in uh, at some point, too. And uh, so this is the second Mrs. Childress who will uh, live until, what, 1983, I think? She, she lived, lived a long time. And Bob will have all his other children. <clears throat> Bob gets the calling to become a preacher in Ararat, Virginia, in the 19-teens, early 20s. And he goes down to Davidson College, north of Charlotte, uh, where he sold apples to pay for his uh, education. And he ends up going to Davidson. He starts, uh, I think, about this time being a student pastor at Mayberry. So he begins uh, his work there. Uh, but, you know, I'm sure all his in-laws and family probably thought he was insane. Here he was with two children, uh, going off to Davidson College to get his degree so he can then go to school and be a preacher. Uh, 1923, he borrowed $100 from his brother, moved to Richmond, and went to the Union Theological Seminary, which is still there uh, in Richmond. And uh, he spent, I think, what, one year there, maybe, or a couple of years there. He got a degree, and uh, he had all kinds of... Uh, all kinds of churches coming for him, wanting him to be their pastor. Uh, he got all sorts of offers, and he turned them all down, and he came back to uh, the Buffalo, where he will start his ministry. Uh, and it's just amazing. He, could, he was offered things like houses, cars, and huge salaries, and he turned it all down to come to the Buffalo and start his ministry. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail about these churches. Y'all, Some of y'all probably know more about these churches than I do. But uh, the man who moved the mountain, of course, uh, makes all these rock churches famous. Bob didn't necessarily build all these churches, you understand. He, they were all, A lot of them were already built, and uh, he's responsible for putting the rocks. I think he got the idea from a church in Tennessee he saw or something like that, and he came back and they started rocking all these churches. So that's... Uh, Bull Mountain, which was his home base. Uh, he started a school there. Uh, he lived there, raised his children there. Uh, and I think they're building a fence there in that picture. I believe that's what they're doing. <laughs> Slate Mountain, right off the Blue Ridge Parkway near the Chateau Morset, is another one of his churches. And here he is later in life with the uh, some of the children. And Bluemont, up at the top of uh, the Gap, uh, almost in sight of Shelby's house. <laughs> uh, he looks very studious there, doesn't he? Yeah. <clears throat> and of course, my favorite is he ends up in uh, in Mayberry, and uh, Andy Griffith's mother is there on the right, Geneva Nunn. She was from over here, I think near Kibler Valley. I think that it impressed me is, you know, I'm in a modern car driving, and it ain't easy to get all these churches in a modern car. And there he was in that uh, Model T or whatever he drove, a mule, a horse, and uh, he's going all around servicing all these, all these churches. And it's really quite amazing if you ever realize the distance involved in doing all of that. Tom, is he... Is he stuck? I, I think he's stuck, Mary. I see a chain there. <laughs> like, I think he's stuck. Or he's posing for a picture. He's got a woman helping him. I just said. Supervise him. He's got a woman to supervise him. She has her hand on the chain. Probably her idea to get him. Oh, Lord. Y'all rough. Poor old Bob. Y'all rough. Poor old Bob. Get that woman out in the mud. Get close. 
Probably some man making a picture. That's probably right. This was, this was not the reaction I was expecting. <laughs> well, we want to add to the story. The, the other thing was about this, at one time in the books they talk about he had as many as 14 churches. Now, how in the world? I'd love for somebody, I don't know if you know what the 14 were. We know about six or seven, obviously. But I don't know what the others were. 14 churches, that, that's just unbelievable that he could do that. Of course, not all at once. Not all, all at once. But this is Dinwiddie, which is up north of uh, Hillsville, was one of them. And, of course, uh, this is the church in Willis, which I don't believe is Presbyterian anymore. Uh, but this is one of Bob's churches. And, of course, that's him and all his sons, I think, during World War II. During World War II. Bob Childers practiced his ministry for 30 years, 1926 to 56. In August of uh, 1950, he had a stroke. I think it paralyzed him uh, kind of on the right side. He was getting so many visitors that his doctor sent him to Florida to get away from his constituents there. Uh, and uh, one of the stories... Throughout his life, I, would, I was just amazed by this. Whenever he would need help or he would need money, all of a sudden, he was in Florida. I think they said he got $2,000 in the mail. People sent him money because of what he had meant to their lives or to help him. When his children needed Christmas presents, uh, Christmas presents would magically show up. Things like that. Uh, and throughout his life, if you read the books, this happens over and over and over again. He's going to have another stroke in December of 1955, and he'll die on January the 16th, 1956 in Roanoke. And, of course, he's buried at the Buffalo. You can see the Buffalo right over his tombstone there. If you look, you look really hard. Uh, so uh, I, bet, I think the best quote about... Uh, the good this man did. What you don't know is, you know, he started businesses, sawmills, he started schools, he got roads paid, he got roads fixed. He did all these things in addition to 14 churches. Uh, it's just amazing the, the impact that he had on these people. And uh, there's this great line, I think, in The, the Man Who Moved the Mountain. And let's see if I can find it. See, Carolyn, that's what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was going to end. I was going to end on this. This was uh, uh, two guys were walking away from Bob Childress's funeral, and one of them says uh, to the other one, uh, "Bob Childress is gone. You won't have another Bob Childress. There just won't be another." And his buddy says. Uh, there won't never need to be one. We stood up. We were there two hours as people stood up and talked about what Bob Childress had done for them in their life. And it's, it's hard for me to think that anybody could do that. But one lady said something happened to her feet and her feet were swollen and she couldn't get her feet in her shoes. Bob Childress went to town and bought her a pair of bedroom slippers so that she could uh, have shoes to wear. And Jimmy Puckett, who is her nephew, talked about how all the children loved him so much and he would load the car up and take them to get ice cream on Sunday afternoon after he had preached. And Jimmy said they loved Uncle Bob because he loved ice cream and he'd take all of them. But I'd give anything if we had recorded that because everybody had a Bob Childress story that was just amazing what he had done. And I mean, he, he wouldn't just, you know, walk out here and do it. It might take sacrifice on his part, but he would do it. He just was a remarkable man. And sadly, we did not get that, that recorded. Tom is a great story catcher. He's got a whole table back there of, of stories that he's been catching, and Shelby's been catching stories. So, you know that that's what that's what I'm about is just hanging on to these stories and finding them and preserving them. So, why am I here, and why am I writing a book about Bob Childress, who, of course, I never had the honor of meeting? 
Well, my great grandfather, William Osborne Childress, and Bob were brothers. And one year ago, this weekend, I published this book, and this book is, it focuses on really the children of Bob and the children of Bill. So Bill had 11 children, Bob had eight children, so this, the book really is about these 19 children of these two brothers. But also, as Tom said, the final chapter is written by Bob himself. Bob started an autobiography that he never finished. So since he never finished it, it was not published. So that's, that's the final chapter of, of this book. So I just want to read a little bit to you. And since our focus is on Bob Childress today, I'm going to read to you some of his autobiography just to share that with you. And I do have copies of the book you can buy. They're $18.95. And if you're not going to read it but once, just go to the library and get it. The, the, li the public libraries have them as well. But it's, it's stories that if you're local, you'll probably want to want to read these stories because they are fascinating. So I'm reading, I will read first the beginning of Bob Childress's autobiography. This is his words. I was born in a mountain cabin, the seventh of nine children, in a section of Patrick County known as the hollow section. Our little cabin did not have a floor or a window. We were poor, the poorest of all our neighbors, and they were all poor. My folks did not consult me about being born. Possibly if they had, I would never have consented. People didn't consult anybody in those days, not even themselves. They married, they had babies, many babies, and that was all. No preparation for them, but they came and managed to live, most of them. We had no doctors or nurses. Sometimes the mothers would have to stay in bed a few days, but usually not many days. One mother was picking berries when her baby was born. She was about half a mile from home when it came. She had quite a debate with herself whether to leave her berries and send back for them or leave the baby and send one of the other children back for it. She finally decided to take the baby and the berries, so she came home with her baby in her apron and her berry bucket on her arm. My mother was in bed when I came, but we had a hard time. I was a crybaby. I couldn't help it. The cabin was cold. I was naked and hungry. They did not even have seat covers for me, just lying in bed among rags. With no food on the inside and no heat on the outside, I just had to cry. They said I had three months colic. Mother had to get up from her bed of rags and leave me. And I was lonesome. I was, not, I was now lonesome in addition to being hungry and cold. It didn't take my folks long to find a remedy that calmed me somewhat. All the mountain families kept brandy, and it didn't take much to calm a little sick baby. We did not have sugar to weaken it with, but dipping a rag in molasses and soaking it in brandy seemed to work. Guess that's how I learned to chew the rag. My three months colic lasted till spring. Do you know what chew the rag means? I had to look it up. I've heard of chewing the fat, but it's the same thing, chewing the rag. So he's making a joke there with this, he's, he's chewing the fat. I was born in January when the warm weather came and I could be left out in the sunshine, I stopped crying so much. Mother's health began to improve too, and I got more food. Babies were not weaned in those days, mountain babies, but continued to nurse their mothers till the next baby came along. And if the mother was strong and had given enough for two, she would hold the baby in her arms to feed 
and the other one, old enough to stand, would stand by her side and nurse. I've seen the little one try to push the big one away many times, and there would be scratching and crying. No one can blame them. They were fighting for their living. Such were the conditions under which I was born. I did not like it much, but there was nothing I could do about it. The babies did not all live. Neither did the mothers. Many died. If a man lost his wife, he usually started out very soon to look for one to take her place. Of course, he always wept loud and long over his loss, but he was easily consoled. There's a story of one man who seemed hard to comfort at his wife's funeral. <coughs> He kept crying as the grave was being filled, and after it was filled, his grief seemed so great that everyone found it hard to leave the grave. He sat with his head in his hands and shook with grief. Finally, the preacher went to him and placed his hand on his bowed head and said, My brother, I know it is hard. We all sympathize with you. We can't do no more. But I can point you to one that can help you bear your troubles. The man stopped shaking and the tears stopped falling and he raised his head and said to the preacher, where is she? <laughs> <laughs> if a man lost his baby and it was very young, he would be consoled with the thought of predestination and say, this is hard to understand, but it was meant that way, and when a thing is meant that way, ain't no use to worry. But if the child was big enough to work, he might say, what a pity, just getting big enough to work. Okay. I'm going to skip lots of pages here, go from being, being a baby to being all grown up now. I had quite an experience about this time with an old lady who lived in Squirrel Creek. Squirrel Creek was about six miles away, but I felt I should visit this old lady because she was sick and I was about the nearest preacher to her. I was beginning to think of myself as a preacher and others were calling me preacher. I took a big Bible under my arm and went to see the old sick lady. She was really very ill, but seemed very happy. She said she was 105 years old. I told my friends later that she didn't look to be more than 104. <laughs> anyway, she was sick. When I arrived, she said, did you bring me a drink of whiskey? I thought, here's a good chance to witness a bit. The room was full of people, her sons, grandsons, and other relatives, and I was sure that they'd already had a drink or two. So I told my own story about drinking, its evils, and what it had done for me and my own folks. I told her I had quit whiskey and never meant to touch it again. She was very quiet when I had finished for a moment, and I was feeling like I'd scored when she said, well, I don't blame you. I'd rather have brandy myself. <laughs> <laughs> I met another very interesting lady about this time. I had managed to get a little Ford T model. Sometimes it would run. And one day while driving along a little mountain road, I overtook this old lady who was walking with her grown son and daughter. I invited her to ride. She said, I'm afraid to ride that thing. I insisted and finally persuaded her to do it. I got her seated next to me with her daughter next to her and her son standing on the running board. It had no starter. I had to crank it and when it started, her son jumped off and ran away. She and her daughter tried to get out, but could not get the door open. She was yelling at the top of her voice to try to get it stopped. I rode with her arms around my neck and her cries ringing in my ears, stop it, stop it. When we finally arrived at her place, which was not far, 
we had a really good visit, which was followed by many more. We became great friends, and this friendship lasted till her death, which was only a few years away. She was a great character. I spent many hours with her and listened to her tell her experiences. She said that she had taken off all her clothes 40 years ago and washed all over, but it had made her sick, and that she promised her good Lord that if he would forgive her, she would never do it again. <laughs> I am sure she was faithful to her vows. <laughs> So anyway, Stuart, if you'd like to come up and say a few words, we'd love to hear what you'd like to say about your grandpa or anything else. <laughs> Except you, right? No, you can abuse me. I'm used to, Shelby's here. I'm used to abuse. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Up. Well, first of all, thanks for being here. Um, when Tom told me about this event, I thought, well, that sounds interesting. I wonder if anybody will show up. So I was pleased when I pulled in the parking lot and saw how many cars there were. Thanks for being here. Before I preach you a sermon, because preachers always have to preach a sermon, right? And it'll be a mini sermon. Let me, when I walked in the door, Tom was saying there were things about the book that he liked, things that he didn't like. And I agree with that. Uh, one of the things I don't like about the book is it seems to sort of pit the Presbyterians against the primitive Baptist. And Grandpa was not that way. Um, Richard Davids, I think, embellished that rivalry a lot. Um, he had a lot of good friends that were Baptist and primitive Baptist. And although theologically they didn't agree on everything, they agreed on the most important thing, right? That Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of all, and that's the thing that matters. So. I think Grandpa would be a little upset that the book sort of tries to embellish that rivalry because it wasn't really there. Um, the other thing I don't like about the book is that it seems to give him too much credit. I think he would be embarrassed. I had a person come up to him, have a number of people come up to him and say, do you realize how many people your grandfather saved? And I said, I know exactly how many he saved. Zero. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And so I think that Grandpa would be a little embarrassed that he gets too much credit for that, uh, that it was the Holy Spirit at work through him, which is one of the things I like about the book, because I think it shows you how God can take ordinary people, and if they're willing to step out in faith, do extraordinary things through them. Uh, I like that part. The sermon part I'm going to tell you that I like has to do with the rock churches themselves. Uh, most of you know, I guess, the flagship, although Mayberry and Bluemont are older than Buffalo Mountain, they started out as clapboard siding churches. They weren't rock cased until later. Buffalo was the first church that was rock cased from the very beginning, and it was built in 1929. Everybody knows what was going on in 1929, right? The Great Depression. So enter the rocks. The farmers had collected rocks because they tripped them, they tripped their mules and their horses, they broke their plow bits, they were a big nuisance. And so they picked them up and piled them up, sometimes made fences out of them. And so my grandfather had taken a trip to Montreat. Everybody been to Montreat, North Carolina? When you enter there, there's a rock arch that you go under. The assembly inn is rock. And my grandfather, I think, got the idea, that's what my Uncle Brian tells me anyway, that he thought, I think I know a use for those rocks. And so he had everybody collect those rocks and, and bring them. And I think that tells a story in itself. Um, everybody probably remembers the story in the 16th chapter of Matthew, where Jesus and his disciples are in the region of Caesarea Philippi. And he turns to them and he says, who do people say that I am? And the disciples answer, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, some say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus then asks them, but who do you say that I am? And of course, you can probably guess who's the one that speaks up first as usual, right? Simon Peter. So Simon Peter answers, says, you are the Christ, 
the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for God has revealed this to you, not humans. And you are now to be called Peter, and you are the rock upon which I will build my church. So they're going on down the road, I guess, a little bit later, and Jesus starts explaining to them that he's going to have to go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering uh, at the hands of the chief priest and the scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. Well, Peter's going to have none of that. And so he pulls Jesus aside and rebukes him and says, Lord, forbid this. This must never happen to you. Anybody remember how Jesus responds to him? Get behind me, Satan, right? For you have set your mind on human things, not divine things, and have become a stumbling block to me. <clears throat> so here's poor Peter. One moment, he's the rock upon which Christ is going to build his church, right? And the next, it's get behind me, Satan, you're a stumbling block. And so I think that's what the rock churches, both the buildings themselves and my grandfather's ministry, tell us. That we all have a choice in life, right? We can either build a building block for God's kingdom, or we can be a stumbling block for God's kingdom. The choice is yours, one or the other. And so every time I look at the churches or I think of my grandfather, that's what I think of. Um, Commercial-wise, I can't get up here without doing a commercial. We're actually having a revival night at Buffalo Mountain Tuesday night. Uh, it'll be at 7 o'clock. I guess most of you know where Buffalo's at. Uh, I will be preaching. Robbie and Betty Vance, a lot of you probably know Robbie and Betty Vance. Uh, we'll be providing some of the music as well as some others. So love to invite you and have you join us Tuesday night at 7 o'clock for the revival. Buffalo. Where? It's at Buffalo Mountain Presbyterian Church. So you go... Everybody know where the Dollar General is at Laurel Fort? <laughs> okay, just cross the main highway there. Keep going on what's called Duxborough Road. Like you're going out to Kanawha Valley. Everybody know where that's at? Yeah. But you'll turn, I think it's like three, three and a half miles once you cross the main road there. There's a sharp turn to the right. There's a church sign that says Presbyterian Church. Pine View Road. Turn on that. You have one more turn at a dead and that'll take you to Buffalo Mountain. It's right on the Floyd County, Carroll County line. In fact, the church itself is in Carroll Sport County. Line, right. Sport line. Yep. And the cemetery's in Floyd County. And what's so odd about the church is three of them are that way. Because if Bluemont, the church, is in Carroll County, <laughs> cemeteries in Patrick County. In fact, when I was pastor there, uh, my office was in Patrick County and the church was in Carroll County and my office didn't have any restrooms and I kidded people tell them I had to walk across the county line to go to the restroom. <laughs> and Slate Mountain is that way too. Slate Mountain, you have Floyd and Patrick involved. So I don't know if my grandfather knew about transporting dead bodies across county lines or what it, was, what it was all about, but it's odd of the churches that three of them would be that way. Well, he was from Ohio. I bet he did know that. <laughs> did you um, go up, walk up top of the Buffalo and then go before last on, for Easter sunrise? Yeah, and did an Easter sunrise service? There, yeah, video. okay. Yeah. We didn't do it this year because of the weather. It was, it was cold. so cold, I understand. So we actually did it at the cemetery. Uh, we had the Easter sunrise. So I'm not sure this coming Easter whether we'll do it on the buffalo. Some depends on the weather. I know. Because this time it was awful cold. Yeah, but the year you were up there, it was gorgeous. You got y'all playing guitars, singing? That was Robbie. That was Robbie. Who, no, I, okay, no, I am not musically inclined at all. Henry and Marie can tell you that they were members of Blue or Mayberry Ferns the whole time I was there, 15 years. In fact, I think my dad is the one that talked you into becoming treasurer of the church, wasn't he? Which you were treasurer for how many years? 19. 19. Okay. Any other questions? Well, again, thanks for having me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.
Jesse School. I was just in there yesterday. Oh yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's rough. But yeah. And unfortunately, you see that's been chipped away. No. When the book came out today, I started getting some very chips. Willa Dean Shirley, and I grew up in this church since I was seven. Bob Childress and Mr. Childress and all them were the pastor at that time for many, many years. Wow. And what do you remember most about Reverend Childress? Oh, he was kind and uh, always took time for everybody. He was never too busy to solve any problem or listen to anything that you had to say. And he was always real good with oh. the young people. My name is Lynn Jennings Spencer. I was born right here in Virginia, in, in Pulaski. Uh, when my parents brought me to be baptized, Mr. Childress was the minister here. My mother was a lifelong member of this church. And when he baptized me, he was so sick by that time he wasn't able to haul me. So my parents had to haul me and present me for baptism. And I was the last baby that he baptized in this church. You may, if I know you've read the book, The Man Who Moved a Mountain, mm -hmm. the, uh, the couple that he mentions in the book that was with him when he had his stroke are my grandparents, James Arthur Mitchell and Lucinda Greer Mitchell. Okay. And my aunt, Eva Mitchell Wadsworth, was the person that drove his car back. She was a teenager at the time and had just gotten her driver's permit. Do you have any stories you could share with me about Bob Childress that you remember? Well, probably none that are already known. Um, my mother was one of the children that um, he went around and gathered and took to the movies and took to church. So, oh, really? And yeah. How, you, did he take them by car or did he have a, like a little he had, He had an old Model T car and um, he uh, took it. Or I think he started his ministry on a horse, but he eventually got an old a Model T car and, um, and probably later there were better cars, but there's lots of pictures of him with the Model T. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, he would take them. Uh, he would just go around and gather up the kids in the car and just pile them in <laughs> and take them to church. And mom said the, only, the first time she ever went to a movie, uh, he had taken the kids, probably the Hillsville, uh, to um, to a movie. What do you think his biggest legacy was, Bob Childress? Oh, uh, well, the churches, of course, and the um, and the kindness. Uh, the I think people remember him mostly for his kindness, you know, and his inclusiveness. He he, he had a good word for everybody. It's the best I have ever heard. So what's your name, Rhonda Alderman Horton? And your grandfather or your father? My grandfather, Sally Alderman, and my second grandfather, Yule Burnett, both worked on the construction of the Rock Churches. All of them? Or both just of the, on all of them, but I think maybe one, one, it was a difference. One did one and one didn't do the other one. Oh my gosh, okay. Yeah. And then mom remembers seeing Preacher Childress, and she said he always had on a white suit. Now, that's what she tells. <laughs> and, you know, the kids just loved him. Oh.